What's good, YouTube? We sure. back with another episode of the Track Wolf Godcast. Sure. I'm your boy, Track Beats. We got my man Chino Blizzy in the yeah. building with us today. We also got my man Young Savage, the producer in the building with us sure. today. You know what I'm saying? But uh, y'all make sure y'all like, comment, and subscribe. You know what I'm saying? We're going to continue dropping this good content and, you know what I'm saying, spreading this knowledge. You know what I'm saying? And, Trying to create more opportunities for everybody to kind of branch out off each other and network, you know what I'm saying? But on that note, we got a special guest up in the building today with us, you know what I'm saying? My good brother, man, Jason Fletcher. Hey, thank you guys. Thank you for having me. me. Appreciate it, bro. Thank you man. for coming. Thank How you been, coming. man? Doing well, man. Trying to live in, you know, very trying times. Yeah, you know, man. We're all, you... trying to, all trying to find our way. And yeah, so... yeah. You've been doing a really good job at it, man, lately, man. Yeah. So, uh... Here, yeah, like you uh got something pretty interesting going on with you, so you got like a big high up position in the world. So how did you kind of get to that place? So I wouldn't necessarily call it a, a high up position, but um, <laughs> I definitely put in some work and, and some time to uh, you know find something that I really enjoy doing and I really like giving back. I really like um, helping people, and most importantly, I really like working with kids, yeah. especially kids that come from you know backgrounds where they haven't been given every opportunity to make themselves successful, and so. Sometimes they don't see their worth, and so my job is to make sure they see their worth sometimes even before they see their own worth. And gotcha. so for the last 10 years, I've been working for a company in which I taught for seven years, history, government, economics, things of the sort, and then I got a promotion to um, dean. So now I you know, do all the behavior things, yeah. come up with plans for them to, to be successful because I need them to know that I'm the number one cheerleader. So. <laughs> So you had to been putting in some pretty good work, you know what I'm saying, for them to skip over all the other employees and be like, you know what, Jay, I'm about to put you in this position right here. You know, I, I think I keep it a stack with everybody all the time. There's no surprises. I, I give you who I am right up front. Yeah. Um, I'm always up front with the kids. Um, I'm respectful. And respect takes you a long way. Um, and I don't it think does. people realize that nowadays. Um, respect is a big thing. And just being respectful in general kind of got me into my position. Um, hard work, education, things of the sort, things that, you know, have been told for me, to me from the beginning, ever since I was like five years old, get your education, work hard, nothing's going to be given to you. And so nothing was given to me. Yeah. I put myself in a position where nobody could say no to me. Gotcha. So how does it feel like, um, or how do you manage yourself and your emotions with like communicating and dealing with the other you know what I'm saying? Little humans that you're like, you know, with. <laughs> so, you know, I work with kids from first grade up to seniors in high school. So working with different kids from different ages involve different things. And yeah. so keeping my composure is, is the big thing. So it's a lot of mental health things that you got to work with. Um, but I definitely, I give them my all and I check my ego at the door because my concern when I'm at work and working with these individuals is to make sure that they're cared for and they know that they're the most important. So I check my ego at the door. So has that been the, your motto since you stepped in the door? Or has it like something you gradually grown to? You know, it gradually grew to. I mean, we were all kids at one time, yeah. you know, teenagers, early 20s. We all did crazy, dumb things that we look back on and like, hey, you know, probably shouldn't have done that. Or, you know, I wish I'd done it differently. And yeah. so sometimes you get put in positions that you really don't want to be in and you're like, man, I got to change. And so the, the change came. I had to, you know, even see my own worth. And so that was the goal, it was just to, to change. And so now I'm pretty much mellow all the time. You won't see me upset. You won't see me out of character. And if I am out of character, <laughs> there's probably something really going on. So when, when, when I met you, I was like, man, his demeanor, because I'm a mellow guy, I was like, yo, it's a chill dude right here. So going through this process helped you to become this mellow person? Yeah, um, just my life experiences in general helped me become this person. Um, working with with people seeing how you know the struggles and challenges that they go through in life um, it, it was just look I, I need to do something within me to change nobody's gonna change me but myself and so I have to determine yeah. how I'm gonna approach things you know my parents my grandparents everybody that I've met in my entire life everybody you guys anybody I've encountered has definitely contributed to who I am today in some way or another and so you know it's just a just a decision that you, you have to make and so I'm happy with the person I am now. So, and I can understand that. In what ways do you transmute that into the kids? So, my first thing is being mellow with them. 
because if I'm sitting there and I'm treating them as a human being, we're here, it's me and you, it's a one-on-one -on -one situation, and let them know um, how important they are, they're more likely to come to the table and talk to me. If I walk yeah. in a room yelling at them, screaming at them, uh, they're not going to communicate with me. They're going to meet my anger with their own anger, and we're not going to get anywhere. So um, I try to encourage them to, to be patient. Um, you can't communicate when you're not patient. When you're an individual that's angry and it's all inside of you and you start screaming, you can't communicate. Like if I came in here and yelled at you, you'd be like, yo, what the heck is he talking about? Yeah. Like, you're not even going <laughs> to talk to you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So as a teenager, I've got to be able to meet them somewhere, be able to have that conversation with them, make them feel comfortable. And so that's where I start. And then I'm a role model to them. They see when they're trying situations, trying times, and they see how I respond to it. And the goal is to get them to model that. And once they model it and they practice it, that's when a change occurs in those young men, or young women most of the time too. So. Yeah. So like, for me, um, I do similar. I do something similar in life in general. For me, it came from a place of um, I was never treated that way. And I like to, like you said, lead by example and show people how to treat me. Mm -hmm. Is that like a motivation in what you do? Yes. Um, I went to Almore High School. Okay. Um, Chris went to yeah. Almore High School as well. So yeah. um, there were some times in life that I did just enough to get by, yeah. and the teachers just ignored me. He wasn't a troublemaker. He wasn't this, but I never had anybody like to push me and give me some motivation. Yeah. There was like one or two teachers that. You know, would jump on me. School um, too big. Yeah, yeah. It, it was big. I mean, we had people in the building who looked out for us. Miss Holland was one yeah. of those individuals. Very you know. few. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out Miss Holland again. We yeah. mentioned her before on another episode. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, she get a lot of love. Good, yeah, and she should. She yeah. should. You know, that's yeah. that's a, a woman that basically yeah. helped form a lot of men into who they are today. Yeah. And that says a lot for an individual. Subconsciously, don't even. Yeah. She do what she was doing, oh, but. Yeah. While everybody else was, we was all around there going through the process, we didn't really understand. I mean, I and then all, you look back on it. I mean, I was encouraged to like work hard in her class, but I never got an A. Like, I always got a B. And I was like, man, I should be getting an A in this. She's like, you just got to work harder. And she kept doing it and doing it and pushing me and pushing me. And I was like, I said, I'm doing more work than anybody else in this room. How come yeah. I'm not getting an A? Yeah. But that was my, my motivation. And so I try to make she sure... She saw more of you. See, she, it's almost like she saw her students individually. Correct. You know what I'm saying? Because... I didn't do no work and she passed me. <laughs> but indeed, she gave me the D, here you go, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, I, I got my beat. I worked she hard saw, on yeah, too, she but saw the potential on you, so yeah. she made sure she pushed you a little bit more. So I try to push my kids too. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, if they're not motivated, there's nothing. So I, you know, I give them compliments on things. Like we have uniforms. So if kids are coming in in their uniforms, they look clean, you look clean today. You know, I refer to them as young man, yes sir, those things. So yeah. they can, Feel their worth, you know. Yeah. And so I try to motivate them and give them that extra encouragement that I didn't get. And people can be self motivated, but when you've been beat down your entire life, it's hard to get that motivation yeah. back. You know, so how do you teach that to them? What are like some small steps you would or points so, you would give So them? usually, you know, I meet with every kid that comes in a building. Um, get to know who they are, get to know their life experiences, and sometimes I'll share some of mine too. They don't need to know everything, but they need to yeah. understand that, hey. You are the year and they person, right? They I'm a human. I'm a human. I, I, mean, I make mistakes. Yeah, I got to come through me. It's yeah, and me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm not afraid to let them know that I, I'm wrong. If I make a mistake, that's my fault. I apologize. And they give it a look, there's an adult apologize that. Apologizing to me, I'm a human. Yeah. Humans make mistakes. Computers make mistakes. Things yeah. make mistake, mistakes. And so, I, I definitely. I give them plans. So the plan was like, hey, you know, if this situation comes up, try this. See how it works out for you. If it doesn't work, then we'll go with something else. But usually I, I'd be like, hey, you know, try this, try this, try this. And if it doesn't work, you try something. And then usually they'd be like, well, my plan didn't work. Mr. Fletcher, yours did. Cool. Let's build on that. So I give them little goals so they can make accomplishments. We don't want to set the goals all the way up here. Because yeah. if you set the goals high, you're setting them up for failure. Something yeah. small. Coming to school today. Doing your work. You know, tucking in your shirt. Just, yes, sir. Anything like that is an accomplishment and so you start building those accomplishments accomplishments and they start mm -hmm. to flourish they start to um, develop into individuals that that's a good could be concept successful. yeah so when you first started teaching mm -hmm. and i know a lot of people have problems dealing with troubled kids and mm -hmm. stuff and how was your patience at first so i'll be honest at first i was a little intimidated um you know First year teacher, I'm working with kids that you know oh, may come with a folder that's like this thing. You know, this kid yeah. can be violent. This kid's disrespectful. This kid is is that. And so 
I try to reach them completely on their level, and that makes me comfortable too. Like when they can sit yeah. there and they can reach out, and we can talk about random things. So like I may be teaching U.S. history, but maybe a kid saw something on the news, hey, Mr. Fletcher, you know, I saw this about this airplane or whatever. So we'll talk about airplanes. Um, I had kids that uh, liked to build cars, and they didn't know. And so I'd say something about cars or motors, and they're like, oh, Mr. Fletcher's cool. And so once I was able to break that barrier, they became more comfortable with me. I became more comfortable with them. And then we were just put in a situation where it's like, hey, we're both here. Let's make the best of this. So what is your goal? And some of their goals are, hey, I want to go back to public schools. All right, if that's your goal, that's my goal too. So whatever your goal is, let's get it done. And so that helped me find my groove and how I wanted to handle things. And so I don't have a million success stories. I have some success stories. But if you can save one kid, you can potentially save a family or even yeah. a generation, and, and that's the goal, is to help as many people as you possibly can. So do you accept everyone? We don't accept everyone. There are some kids in our school, we yeah. don't, there are some kids that we may not be the best fit for. Okay. And so even if I'm working with a young individual, and I may want them to be there, there are some services I can't offer them. So I don't want to waste six months of their time, or a year of their time, telling them that, hey, I can help you, and I can't. So, you know, we'll sit down yeah. with the team and we'll work like, hey, you know, this student needs this, this person needs that. And I can't really offer that to them. And I let them know, like, hey, you can reach out to me, you can email me, you can call me. I'm always here. But my job is to make sure you're successful, even if that's not with me. Gotcha. So you give them other options as well before you just Correct. tell them, like, hey, yeah, yeah, we're, it's not going to work for us. Correct. I mean, we'll try everything. Anything I possibly can. Um, so but you try them in the school first before you tell them. So they come in for, like, an interview. Yeah. And so we talk about what we do as a whole at the school. We also discuss a little bit about um, our plans, their goals, what we want to do. And uh, we ask them, is this something that you can do? I've had kids straight tell me no. And the ones that tell me no are the ones sometimes I get most intrigued by. Yeah, because there's something... Dig more <laughs> I'm like, so something here is going to make you face a fear that you have. Whether that fear is yeah. being successful or, or whatever it may be, you just flat out said no. So I was like, hey, you know, I want this kid. And so, you know, we try to work with, with everyone that we can, but there are sometimes it just won't happen, which is a little too difficult. Yep. So, like, I'm sure, well, it seems like even the kids that get accepted in there, there's some type of, like, um, admiration for their story of what, or what they've been through. So let's say you have a student and things don't turn out for the best and you have to suggest another option for mm -hmm. them. How does that affect you personally, and does it affect you personally? So, I have a personal connection with like all of my students. So I can sit there and tell every kid something about themselves. I, I know their work ethic, I know what I can and cannot say to them to motivate them. Yeah. And so if I can't reach them, I do sometimes take it personally, because I'm like, man, maybe, maybe I fell, <laughs> okay? But mm -hmm. then I realize that you know sometimes yeah. I can't be everybody's yeah. savior. I can't be yeah. everybody's hero. So there are times like when a bullet. Okay. Yeah. So there are sometimes, you know, you brush it off, you wish them their best, you make it known that, hey man, I care about you. You can reach out to me. I'm still here in your corner, even if you don't see me every day. So I take it personally, but usually by the end of the day I'm like, okay. You you know, I've, got, other, I've got other kids I gotta work with too. And so that that's my goal. I, I can't pause everything for one individual when I can work with so many other people too. Yeah. And you know, later down the road, that kid may return. You know, he may come back with some different school, uh, different skills or something, and like, hey, let me work with you now. Yeah. So, but I'll definitely go to the end with, with any of my kids. Um, I still have former students now that have seen me in the streets with their best friends, and they're doing whatever, and they'll stop whatever they're doing and run across the street and give me a hug. Hey, Mr. Fletcher, man, you know, I appreciate you. And, you know, knowing that I made a difference in their life, yeah. It's big for me because what I noticed when I was teaching in Charlottesville, a lot of my, my young brothers who I was uh, working with and educating, they didn't have a positive male figure in yeah. their life. So, you know, being that individual sometimes, just showing them, you know, this is how you should conduct yourself. This is the things you should do um, when you're engaging with women or on a job interview and stuff. And yeah. they, they build on those things. And so when you can teach them those skills, it works. It works. It's kind of like math it's a process you know you don't jump right into calculus yeah, you know you no. start with addition and subtraction you know yeah, multiplication and division, division and you yeah. start working your way up 
you know, behavior, your life and stuff is at step two. Like we are all taught in different phases. And so that's why there's a different phase in everybody's life. So, you know, a 50 year old having a conversation with me, like maybe on paper, I might be smarter now. I'd never say that, but maybe on paper, some college says, hey, Mr. Fletcher's smarter now. But he has 50 years of living experience, experience. Yeah. right? So I got to yield my respect to that individual because yeah. he, he's 50. That's what we keep forgetting to do with our elders is give them that respect for living this long. Yeah. Like if we know we experience the type of shit we experience in the time that we've been here, and you got somebody that's 70, 80, you know what I'm saying? You can only imagine the type of shit they experience, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we got generations that saw things that, you know, we read about in history books. Yeah. You know? So like you look yeah. at civil rights, for example, man, you know. We sit there and talk about all the things that, that we've done and what we've read or whatever. There are people that actually live through that stuff. People it's who got still, arrested. Yeah. And, and, you know, we talk about, like, it was so long ago, my father went to a segregated school. Yes. And, and you know, that's not, not that long ago. I was about to say, none of it was that long ago. Like, <laughs> yeah, about 60, yeah. 60 years ago, something like and that. And they just started saying 60, like, my grandmother in her 80s, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, yeah. And then when I was telling them, like, I talked to her. And she lived in Philly first, mm -hmm. moved down to Florida, then moved up to New York. So okay. it's like she had a lot of free range. Yeah. And yeah. my grandmother picked cotton when she was a kid. Oh. And she's yeah. only sixty three. So I know some guy I know some older people now that won't pick the cotton out of a Tylenol bottle because they're like, I'm not gonna touch the cotton drama. because it's just like no, I'm not, I'm not messing with it. Yeah, and I understand. But you know, I think for our younger generation, especially our young black men, we have to let them know and remind them you know how far we've come like show that respect to our elders because they've they've been through a lot and we still have a long ways to go and i think part of the issue is we forgot where we came from there's no connection between the new generation and then the older generation you know what i'm saying but i think our generation where we at in the middle mm -hmm. is kind of trying to mold that shit together right. before it falls all the way apart you know what i'm saying because if if we don't catch it here then it's done well, the other issue we have, too, is we don't have leaders. No. When we do have a leader, kill, yeah. assassinate. Some, something happens yeah. to them. So I think some people get afraid to, to possibly step up. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we look up to the wrong people. Yeah. Take like, the words out of my mouth. Yeah. So, like, if you live in, I don't know, a particular neighborhood, a guy who maybe goes to school, gets educated, maybe becomes a lawyer, he doesn't come back to his neighborhood. Yeah. He's like, I'm done. And he goes somewhere else. And the only people that are left in the neighborhood are the guys that might be stuck in their situation and decide to live by other means. Yeah. And the kids tend to look up to those individuals and say, that's the only thing I have in my life. That, that's what I have to look forward to. And that's not the case. So I think it's important for people who are successful to come back to the communities and, and teach or just talk, or educate. Be somebody yeah. that an individual can talk to. Okay, so like, I, I'm a person that's aware that some people that that may have had walks of life like that and don't come back to the communities is because the community never respected them. Um, so like, and you know, they also don't respect people who appear like that, who speak like that. Right. So like, what would you say to someone who may feel that way about their community? So I think it first starts with being there, right? Because just going back to the community and making you know yourself seen making yourself known yeah. um i think that reachable reachable yeah, yeah. Uh, i think a lot of the times what ends up happening is if you have a successful black man um who is educated you start throwing some random things at him oh he must be gay he must be this or whatever you want to say about him and they don't see that person for who they are you know yeah. here, here's a person who's successful so you got to get down break bread with him you know, I've noticed that just sitting down having a conversation with somebody over food yeah. will, will open up the door. But you've got to reach them. you got to get them out of that environment sometimes. There are a lot of kids that I've seen, like, I take kids to Bush Gardens at the end of the school year. Never left Charlottesville. Yeah. Never left Charlottesville. For whatever. And so they never saw anything outside of that. And so, hey, Mr. Fletcher showed me this. All right, well, Mr. Fletcher was there. Like, I, when I was in high school, I lived in Whitewood. So um, I grew up in Whitewood. Most of the kids that I grew up with are in trouble, um, or just now starting to find. Whitewood themselves. used to be reckless back yeah. then when you was there. Yeah. That was before they remodeled <laughs> it and everything. Yeah, I, I lived in Whitewood, yeah. and uh, you know, there's I made it out. Uh, there's another young uh, older brother to me, now, Jonathan Gaines, who, who made it out was very successful, um, and there are other people who are still trying to find their way. 
Um, you know, a couple guys are, are dead. Jerry Poindexter's, you know, he died in jail. Um, yeah. You know, there, there were a lot of us. And so my fault is not necessarily being back in a community um, like I was before. Like I tend to go into other communities based upon the kids that I work with, with now. And so um, it, it can be difficult. Um, yeah, but yeah, you just yeah. got to have that drive, that motivation, that want. Like, I want to help people. And I think making a change in society starts with helping helping kids, man. Yeah, I can agree with that a thousand percent, you know what I'm saying? No, on that note, we're going to cut to this break and we're going to swing right back to y'all. So we back from the break, you know what I'm saying? So what we about to get into now, you know what I'm saying, is Jason's, you know what I'm saying, upbringing, you know what I'm saying? I know we got a little bit into discussing yeah. about as far as Whitewood, but. Yeah, so I'm originally from a small town called Skyler. Mm. You'll never see it on the map. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> and so, and if you do see it on the map, you're probably calling it Shuler. So it's, <laughs> oh. it's Skyler. And I, I'll be honest, it, as far as diversity, it doesn't exist there. Uh, it was me and my pops. And so um, I was biracial. My mom was a white woman, blonde hair, and my dad, a black man, you know, in the late 70s and 80s, that could be dangerous for yeah. both of them, especially yeah. in a very rural area. Mm. But, you know, and my parents split when I was like five years old, so my mom and I moved back down to my grandmother's in Skyler. And so the house that I grew up in, we didn't have running water. Not at all. So. Um, from early age, I learned to walk down to the creek with my grandmother and get water out of the creek, bring it back to the house. Um, the creek, not even the well. Nah, it's a creek. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. a creek. There's a rock that set in the creek, and the water came right out the ground right there. And she'd go back about six or seven feet to where the fresh water was, and that's where we'd get it. Mm -hmm. And she would carry two big five-gallon buckets of water, and they were like sixty pounds a piece, up this hill. And so here I am with like my one gallon of milk struggle. <laughs> my, grand, my grandmother's just like a champ, just carrying it up the hill, and I was like, okay. And she would just look back and, all right, Jason, come on, come on. And so, you know, we lived off the land. You know, we didn't have. That's smart. I wish yeah. it was kind of that yeah. way. So that's good that yeah. you actually got to experience it. Didn't have a lot. Of, didn't have any money. Um, mm. You know, but we ate. Never knew that I was broke. You know, never knew that I was dirt poor until yeah. you look back and you're like, oh wow. You know, we didn't have anything. But, you know, my grandma always made sure that we were ate, made sure that we were cared for, you know, made sure I was dressed and ready for school. She did all those things. When did uh, you realize you were poor? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I always knew I was broke. So I was like, damn, how you do that? How you did that? So, <laughs> we were poor in financial terms. Yes, of We course. were not poor as far as love and, and caring. But and that's question. Rich that, 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 Rich, that's more valuable. That's how you know you was really poor right. yeah. without no money for real. Yeah. That's when you learn to be happy for yeah. stuff like that. I'm happy I got y'all. Yeah. <laughs> that's all we got. You know? yeah. that, that's literally all you got. And yeah. you know, you had a diet of cornbread and pinto beans on a oh, regular basis. Yeah. And hamburger yeah. helper, which I will not touch anymore because oh, I ate goodness. too much of it when I was younger. <laughs> But it's such a quick, easy meal. I mean, it is a quick, easy meal. It's a quick, cheap meal too that can feed a bunch of people. Yes, yeah. And but uh, yeah, just looking back, um, when I moved to Charlottesville, and even though you know I was living in Whitewood, looking back to where I came from, I, said, man, I didn't even have running water there. Yeah. So you know you're like, oh man, what, what's going on? I mean, I slept on the floor. Like my, we had a mattress downstairs because my grandmother still had a lot of kids. She had nine kids, Damn. so they were all my uncles and stuff. But some of them still lived in the in the household. So we had a mattress that we kept in the basement that I would pull up um, into the, the living room. That's where you know, we slept. Yeah. And uh, you know, I went to school. It was the circumstances that I that I was dealt at the time. Yeah. So you know, and that those circumstances actually encouraged me to to want more. And I was like, this is not how I I, I want to live my life. And it, it wasn't a, a fault on my my grandmother or my mom or anything like that. You know, my mom hitchhiked from Skyland. Um, every morning, she'd leave at 3 o'clock to get to work mm -hmm. at Roses at Bear Throat because that's when they had a Roses at Bear Throat right there where uh, I wasn't yeah, there. Harris, yeah, Teeter, Harris Teeter uh, yeah. is located at. But she would hitchhike. There's I'm no street sure lights. I'm not sure if it's clear how much you're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> she, but she, like for real. Yeah, she would hitchhike <laughs> every morning in the pitch black. Yeah. Um, and then come back. Put her life at risk. Who knows who's going to pick her up. Maybe not bring her back or anything like that. But she 
she did it so she could make sure I didn't completely go without. You yeah. know, I, I never doubted, you know, my parents' love, my grandparents' love, nothing like that. And that's just motivation. And so to me, I think in part of why I care so much for my job is I see kids that are in similar circumstances. And I want to show them gotcha. that there's a way, there's there's hope, there's there's something that you can do. And so, um, like I said, we didn't didn't have a lot of food. We had a garden. Um, I learned to plant corn, peas, wanted to harvest all that stuff. Um, you know, my grandmother taught me like the different phases of the moon, so I knew when to plant stuff, you know, when the first frost was, you know, yeah. stuff that people don't do nowadays because you walk into a grocery store. Real but knowledge. We didn't have a grocery store. And even if we had a grocery store, we didn't even have the money to go into the grocery yeah. store and, and buy things. So, um, you know, we, we lived off the land. We had chickens, we had pigs, we had. Um, rabbits i mean we, we had everything i think i've eaten probably anything you could possibly imagine squirrel rabbit uh, deer. I mean, so how did you get yourself through that process did it really start happening once you got to whitewood or was it after high school so um i'll be honest when i lived in whitewood um it was kind of in my mind at the time i viewed myself as a lesser it was almost like an embarrassment because i lived at albemarle well i went to albemarle but all the kids lived in like these big fancy houses for the most yeah, part. Yeah, and then yeah. there was us. Yeah, that, yeah I was saying that. <laughs> there That's the us. environment. <laughs> it, it, it was us. And so um, you you didn't ride the bus. Like I'd walk to school. Yeah, that's um, right, yeah. And just, you know, it, it, people didn't necessarily look down on you, but it was like, you know, where do you live at? You're like, well, I live in Whitewood. Oh, well, isn't that those uh, little like apartments where there were all the bad stuff happens? Like, it's not bad stuff that's happening. Bro. You just don't, you don't, you know, just don't. That's come all you hear about. Yeah. 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 Um, but shit, shit was going down. I mean, yeah, it was. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you're a victim of certain yeah, things. Yeah, no, but, you uh, yeah. you make it but, nice and subtle. Look, <laughs> I never had any problems when yeah. when I was there, and part of that was. I never was a guy to cause issues. I was always trying to help yeah, people you regardless of the situation yeah. or whatever. You know, I had guys that looked out for me that would like, uh, you know, I'd be outside trying to do something. Like, man, you need to go inside and do your homework. And, you know, and this would be like the guy, the biggest guy, everybody's scared of this dude. And he's like, you need to go inside and do your homework. You know, you need to get out of here. Yeah. And it's just, just stuff like that. Sometimes hearing that makes a, makes a big, big, big difference. But growing up in Whitewood definitely, definitely shaped, um, who I am, and I definitely wanted to to get out of there because uh, I definitely I bumped into you know Dwayne Norwood. Yeah, yeah. I bumped yeah, into yeah. Mr. Norwood yeah. yesterday. You know, we <laughs> chopped it up, and had a good conversation and stuff. But yeah. there are guys that you know I grew up with that uh, we can share that same experience. Yeah, um, and you know some of us, I mean, just don't get the opportunity to to, to share that experience, and that that's super um, important. And I told myself from an early age because. There were times when I lived in Whitewood, I was a bit hungry, you know, and there was no food in the house. My mom just, you know, pay rent, not much. And uh, there were times like that when I was like, I'm not going back to that. So is that why you, once you got the red Honda, you kept it? <laughs> I still do have my red Honda. <laughs> you married it? <laughs> I, I still do have my red Honda. But, but to be honest, uh, so I was telling you guys earlier, I used to collect Jordans. Like I had tons and tons of Jordans. And so everybody would ask me, well, why are you getting these Jordans? Why are you getting these Jordans and not wearing them? The Jordans for me were shoes that I couldn't get when I was in high school because my mom couldn't afford them. Not that she didn't want to get them for me, yeah. she just couldn't afford it. It wasn't one of those options. So for me to be able to go to the store and get those shoes and set them in the closet, I was like, yeah. I'm here. <laughs> this is where I'm at. You know, my mom couldn't get this for me even though I know she wanted to, but it was kind of a reminder, like, hey, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm shooting Those somewhere. are trophies. Yeah, those yeah. are trophies. Yeah, I mean, like, there we go. Those flints. Hey. Those, those flint 13s from 97. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, <laughs> hey, go, baby. I got them. I don't wear them, but I got them. I got them. You know what I'm saying? And then I sold them. Did you sell them? money off. Did you <laughs> say you said that your mother was white? Oh. My mom was white and my dad was black. So a lot of the times when I was growing up, I was raised, um, I was around a lot of people who were white. So my dad's family was in D.C. So um, we go up to D.C. like during the summers on the weekends and stuff like that. But I definitely spent a lot of time with, uh, you know, my mom, my grandmother and stuff. And so when a lot of people would look at and call people like rednecks, those would be like my uncles. So, but, you know, the, the greatest thing about like my family was when my mom started dating my mom, they were very open and accepting to the fact that my mom was with a black man. Mm -hmm. And so 
I can remember growing up, one of my uncles had like Confederate flags like tattooed on his chest. But as soon as I started getting older and could see those and realize what they were, he started covering them up. Yeah, and yeah. so, you know, they're gone. Uh -uh. And so both of my parents passed away in like 2009. My mom passed away in May and then my father passed away a month later in June. Uh -huh. And so um, my uncle, Ryland, who was my mom's youngest brother, um, took my father's death harder than he took my mom's because he was like, yo, that was my brother. And uh, he's like, you know, when I broke my leg, your dad would pick me up and take me places. And so um, to me, that just showed how people could, could change because um, at one point that wouldn't have been like something that would have been accepted in my, in my family whatsoever. Damn. <clears throat> Were you ever growing up once you came from Schuyler, mm -hmm. got to Albemarle, were you mm -hmm. ever like, did you ever wonder why you didn't have a life similar to other white kids, since you didn't have much perspective of how other people lived when you were back home, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, I'll start off, i answer your question slightly in a, in a different way. Okay. Um, it's, there used to be a saying that if you're biracial, half black, half white, you had the best, best of both worlds. And that ain't the case sometimes, <laughs> because yeah. a lot of the times what happens is um, white people automatically see you as black. And then people who are black are like, oh, well, he's half white. So yeah. you kind of get left out in the middle there. And so as a teenager, as a teenager, like in middle school, you're still trying to find who you are. Because at first I was most comfortable around people who were white. That's who I'd always grown up with, exactly. that comfort factor. And so moving to white was a culture shock to me. Because it was complete opposite, yeah. complete opposite, and um, you know, I never really questioned, you know, why I didn't have certain things. Mm -hmm. um, when you live in very rural areas at that time, education, and I'll come back to education a couple times, wasn't necessarily high on the priority list. Yeah, uh, my grandmother had a third grade education. Mm -hmm. um, she was expected to contribute to the house. She was expected to work in the garden and do those things. Uh, most of my uncles didn't graduate. Uh, my mom graduated high school. Uh, my father graduated high school too, but I was the only one in my family that went to college. Yes. And uh, I mean, people were so independent there, and my family was very pride. Well, they had a lot of pride that they didn't really reach out for for help or anything like that. So I never questioned why I didn't have those things, but you kind of assume why. You know, they're yeah. doctors, they're lawyers, or whatever. You know. Yeah. Maybe their parents did this, or maybe they were lucky. But yeah. you know, you didn't focus on those things. I was always taught to focus on the things that you do have. So yeah, true. That's where I was at. Yeah, it's a really good standpoint to have. You know what I'm saying? A lot of life experiences. You know what I'm saying? And the way you take them on, you know what I'm saying, makes a difference as well too. You know what I'm saying? And it sounds like you took yours as like a learning lesson. You know what I'm saying? Like you was. Acknowledge him as you was experiencing them almost. You know, every experience that you have in life shapes your decision making in the future. Yeah. So you, the three of us could be put in the same situation, but how we handle it may be different based upon how you were raised, how you were raised, how I was raised, or the situations we've experienced in life. And so my life experiences definitely shaped how I respond to things or how I handle different things. And even the way you've been talking about, um, handling the kids and approaching the kids, those are things that have sculpted my life. Like someone just giving me some attention and being like, make sure you do this, you know what I mean? Someone being very presentable, speaking oh, yeah. well, you know what I mean? Rather than chastising you, I'm trying to understand you were level with you. Correct. And you know what I mean? I had one teacher um, from sixth grade, her name's Miss Leeback. And um, she was my language arts teacher and my reading teacher. And she was that one lady who just pushed me. I wanted to do well in her class. I wanted to do her work. I wanted to do all these things because I wanted to make her happy because she yes. showed me that, that respect. And so she always encouraged me to do well. And even though I only had her for one year, I'm not sure where I would be without that encouragement. And I think every person needs that one individual to give them that boost, to give them that, that help. Yeah. And so I take my daughters trick-or-treating because I'm a father, I have two kids, and uh, take them trick-or-treating, and in this neighborhood, I bumped into Miss Leeback. I haven't seen her in, <laughs> I don't know, 25 years. And I saw her, and I was like, Miss Leeback, 
do you remember me? She's like, I'll never forget that voice. You're Jason Fletcher. <laughs> <laughs> and so every year when we go trick or treat, and I'd drop roses off at her house, I'd be like, hey, let me see that. Oh, How you doing? Silly. And so she'd bring me books and uh, drop them off at my job or whatever. Just a just a sweet lady who saw something in me I didn't see. So she planted the seed, yeah. and you went and grew on the roses. Yes. You know, she, she's, it sounds she's like a, great a few woman. people saw some potential. You know, it take it takes a village. Process. Yeah, it takes a village. You know, when we were growing up, um, if you were out in the neighborhood, my best friend growing up, um, if I got in trouble, he got in trouble. Um, if his mom came out, you know, in her hair rollers and her, you know, her gown and stuff, you know, that, yeah, that, she <laughs> she yeah. would. Uh, if he was in trouble, get in the car. And I'd be like, okay, well, you in trouble. Jason, don't think you're not getting in trouble. Get your own in the car too. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> you're in trouble, huh? You couldn't. Yeah. You couldn't do anything. Like everybody in the neighborhood had the right to say something to you. Like nowadays, yeah. I, I think we're all guilty. Somebody says something to my kid, I'm like, hold on. Who are you to say something to yeah. my to my kid? Yeah. Yeah. But they have a different experience, so maybe they can teach them something that I can't teach them. I don't want you like getting out of line yeah. with my kid or anything. But if, you know, if it's an educational moment, by all means, have an educational moment. But yeah. Um, but it definitely takes that, that village. It takes a lot of people to shape uh, people. So how did you handle the other um, situations, like, as going through that process, like, not working with the school, but just, like, people around your age, like, having altercations with them? At what point in my life? Like, when I was younger or now? Yeah, more so younger, because I know now you probably got a more mature way of dealing with things. So... I honestly did not get in a lot of trouble unless it was somebody else like mess with a family member or, or a friend. I've always gotcha. been like a very like protective person. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. um and I may be skinny now, I wasn't skinny in high school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so um I was never known as somebody who was like a fighter or anything like yeah. that. I, I was just always I'm here, I'm here. I had a temper, you had to learn how to control your temper. But um there's you know, when people are around, um you know, the right people you make the right decisions like that's yeah. why when you look at like these protests and stuff that's going on you got a bunch of people like people are dumb individuals are not dumb so the smaller that group the smaller uh the closer knit you are yeah. the less likely you are to do some some horrible things and so you know my demeanor's always kind of been quiet and i think that rubs off on people and so that that helps them gotcha. and even even now i have some friends that you know lived rough parts lived in rough parts did some things and I'm kind of that guy that they they will come to and talk to because if they mess up, I'm gonna tell. Them. I was like, I always got your back, but I'm still gonna tell you that, that you're wrong. And so yeah. they'll call and ask, you know, what should I do in this situation? Or you know, if they're about to get in a fight, like it's really worth it. What's the point? What's the point? Just, you know, somebody wants to argue with me and say one plus one is five. Sure, have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's nothing I can say to you. So you know, if somebody literally wants to get to that that physical point or you know, go rob somebody or do whatever, it's like why. What's but the point? You have to deal with the altercations at the school when the kids get into it, right? I do. And so usually I'm the guy that breaks it up. But I'll be honest. Most of our kids are not interested in, um, in fighting. They're trying to protect their pride. So they bark. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. So I, there's been times I closed the door behind me and walked out. And all of a sudden, hey, where are you going? Because they knew I was going to break up the fight. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm gone, they, they weren't interested in it. And so mm -hmm. if two kids are about to fight, I'll sit them down in the room together. We're not leaving this room today. So we talked this out. Well, he said this. And I was like, did you hear him say that? Well, no, I, I didn't hear him say that. So you're going off <laughs> what you think or what somebody else says, and now you're about to, to fight. Yeah. And a lot of times, it may be two young brothers. And I was like, well, you're about to belittle somebody who's going to have some of the same challenges as you in life instead of building that man up. And, uh, you know, let's make him talk through it. Because how, usually, how often does it work? It works almost all the time. And just getting them down. Because I think a lot of times what happens, if you and I have a beat, we have an argument or something, if we don't talk it out and we go our separate ways, that's going to keep building up in my mind. You know, forget Chris, forget Chris, forget Chris. You know, he's probably saying this, and it's just going to get worse. So then when so we see each other, sit it down. You know, as soon as yeah. we see each other, we're going to fight. But now, you know, if I'm mad and you're angry, we sit here and talk as grown men. Like, all right, you know, you may not respect me as much, but that's cool. We can shake hands. I'm going to go my way. There's no need of me attacking your character or anything yeah. like that. We just solved our issues. We have some differences, differences, and then we just just go. That's a nice good it takes, an, it takes yeah. an, an example to an example from someone you would respect mm -hmm. a lot of the times in order for that to work. Oh yeah, it, it definitely definitely does. Um, so I've, is that why you have to lead in some of the other? 
teachers kind of fall back and let you go in? I have earned the respect uh, of the kids in the building because I treat them um, with respect. With respect, and I want them to know their worth. So there are times I can say things to kids that other people can't say in the building because they know me and they know that I'm never going to point them in the wrong direction. And I'll remind them, I'm like, yeah, look, exactly. when have I ever said anything that did not benefit you? Well, Mr. Butcher, you said, when have I ever said anything that did benefit you? And he's like, well, never. Then listen to me now. And then we can <laughs> talk about this again at another time. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I definitely lead by, lead by example. And I definitely... Um, get in situations with certain kids where if they are fighting and I break it up, I know that the kids are not going to hit me in the back. So I, eventually there's two people, yeah. I got to get in the middle of it. So my back's going to be to somebody. and You just I, know that they're yeah. only going at each other, not yeah. you. And so I've had, Mr. Fletcher, move out the way because I don't want to hit you. Well, I'm going to back <laughs> on up out the corner so we don't, yeah. we don't have this situation and, and we're good. And so yeah. I, I think kids that have respect for people that they work with are not going to do anything to harm those people because these kids are coming from situations that are very difficult and for that six hours throughout the day I me and some of my co-workers are going to be the most stable people in their lives so um, they don't want to damage that and I tell them I was like hey you make a mistake today you know tomorrow we start a new slate and we just go yeah. in the beginning. And so I tell them, I was like, I don't expect perfection, just progress. That's what I want. And progress for you this morning That's was getting one. up, putting clothes on, and coming to school. Yeah. Progress. You missed 130 days of school last year. And you progress, were dead. progress. That's a good one, bro. Definitely yeah. like that. But on that note, you know what I'm saying? We're going to cut to this break and we're going to slide back to y'all. <laughs> back from the break all right man we want to get into like your um spiritual religious journey history so like um are you religious or spiritual at all i'd say more spiritual than religious i i grew up um in church um common story here yeah, grew up in a, in a baptist church um <laughs> yeah. but at an early age you know i questioned things yeah and how so, early is early uh, about eight years old, you know, you oh, start early. you start reading things and you're like, yo, come on, you get <laughs> <laughs> come on. That's it. You won't feel in that for real. You're like, oh, come, come on, man, come on, man. come on, yeah, like, some, something I want to ask you about this scripture. Yeah. Right. <laughs> those those, those lick em, stick stickums in like Sunday school, you lick it and stamp it, and you put it down. I was like, that, that picture just don't look right. So you know, yeah. it just doesn't, doesn't add up. And so, you know, I stayed in a church because I think it was expected. You know, you're expected to be in a yeah. church, you put on your sun Sunday uh, clothes, clothes yeah. your nice attire, and you go to church to make an appearance. And the same people that are making an appearance in church were drunk by 1230, fighting in the, in the neighbor's yard. Couldn't so, wait to get out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I started to question, like, what's the message here? And especially when you're going to church and instead of telling me um, or motivating me, you're asking me for money. And yeah. so you start preaching about, you know, you're not yeah. you're not donating enough money, you're not doing you this. Pay your tithes. I'm like, hold up. I mean, I'm not here for the to hear you talk about money. I'm here for you to, mm -hmm. to save my soul or to motivate me or whatever. And so I definitely started questioning. And then there's a couple times I went back into the church, left, came back and you know, a few times and I still always always questioned it. Because I think to a degree religion has been used to, to control the masses. I can agree um, with that. Um, especially when you, you read the Bible. Um, if you look at the time frame and when the Bible was written, like everybody in there should be brown. Yeah. Especially in that area, you know, yeah. where you're talking about or whatever. But that's not where um, you know, it started. Like in the sixties and seventies when the civil rights movement started, there was a huge push to make like Jesus white. And that's when you started seeing pictures of Jesus being white and you're like, you know, What do you mean? God? I've never heard of this. What do you mean? They that? wanted to whitewash it. But there was a push for this? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. There was a Huge publicized push. push. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. They wanted to make, because if the Savior is white, then you know we have more aligned with the Savior yeah. than, than people of color. Well, yeah, this knowledge is common knowledge. Why do, would people follow and like not be aware of a black a lot brown of Jesus? Ignorance is bliss. A lot of people don't want to research or really dive into it. So like there are a large amount of people that believe that um, the real people of the book or the Jews were black. Yeah, they yeah. was Jews, and not so, Jewish. Correct. 
Correct. And yeah. so that's kind of been like washed out out of history. And yeah. you know, there are people going to argue the other side. I'm, you know, I'm not here to argue everything. I wasn't there. And you know, facts have been handed down for centuries. So we don't know where they might have got distorted. Yeah. But I, I definitely had started, you know, questioning things. And so the biggest thing for me was I think people sometimes take the Bible too literally. Yeah. And by that I mean, let's say we take Noah's flood, right? Everybody's like, the whole world flooded. I said, okay, I'm listening. But the amount of water required for that would be crazy. And on top of that, you expect me to believe that Noah was able to get all of these animals on a boat. Yeah. So somewhere out there, somebody believes that a penguin waddled all the way from Antarctica to the Middle East and got on a boat. Nah, man. Yeah. He, 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 yeah. nah, man. he rode the turtle from finding Nemo. Yeah, yeah. Talking about yeah. a jet stream. But, but, but they want to go over They want to go over there. Yeah, man. <laughs> but now, if you take that story in context and say Noah's world flooded, what Noah knew to be the world, and he put the animals that were common in that area, makes more sense. Because it doesn't take away from the story. Yeah. yeah. But it's just not as vast as people wanted to want to believe it to be. Yeah, so you kind of flow with, with your spirit feels, you know uh, what I'm saying? Not really so much as what the masses are saying. Right, I mean, I do believe in prophets. Yeah. I do believe that there are very influential people who enter this world that have a different spiritual vibe um, than all of us, okay? Yeah. Jesus, you know, Muhammad, anybody. Like, those individuals are teachers. Um, but they all if you listen to their words, encourage us to be better people, like to uh, be spiritual, not necessarily uh, live in fear, I would say. But nowadays, it's more, if you don't do good, you're going to hell. But I, don't really, I don't really hear no teachings of defending yourself either, though. Hmm. Well, so, so in, in Christianity, which I'm more familiar with Christianity, we grew up in the United States. Yeah. So when we think of the Middle East, people think Islam. And so here in the United States, most people are, are Christians. Christian. That's what we've been... Yeah. I'm firm believer that you're sometimes born into your religion. Yeah. So like if you're yeah. in Iran and you're born in Iran, there's about 99.9% yeah, yeah. chance yeah. that you're going to be a Muslim. All right? Here, you're typically introduced to Christianity at a very early age. Um, un unless you live in like a very urban center, like maybe in New York, maybe your family may be a little different or Atlanta. Yeah. But um, in, in Christianity, we're taught that no matter what crime I commit, if I acknowledge that crime and pray, pray for forgiveness, it's forgiven. But if I do you wrong and I ask you for forgiveness, are you going to forget? You might forgive, but you ain't going to forget that I did you wrong. Nah. So, so and I'm, God, Jesus, that's, that's all above me. There, there are different playing fields than I'll ever yeah. be on. But forgiving somebody is big. Yeah, forgetting it is. is even even bigger because it, it's hard to do. I forgive him, but forget. Uh, no, 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 never no. forget. No, you never forget things. Never, because so, what happens is you attach it a feeling with that. You know what I'm saying with that thought. So, but even like with all the religions that are in the world, they all have a common theme, and that's reuniting with something, a higher power. And yeah. um, I think. Currently, much like politics, religion divides people. Um, like if I turn on the news, I'm not going to throw any particular news out there. Um, you would think the Muslims are anti, like completely anti-Christianity. When in fact, in like the Quran, for example, Jesus is mentioned more times in the Quran than he is in the Bible. Because you have the Old Testament, New Testament. And to, yeah. to Muslims, they study the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they say Jesus is a, is a prophet. And so... There, there's so many questions out there. Like, could I be being led in the wrong direction? And so, at that point, you kind of step back and, and you ask yourself, what, what is my purpose here? Um, you know, does, does God or does higher being want me to bring something to the table that I'm not even aware? Yeah. Um, and so, I let my spirit guide me. Like, if it feels right, then I do it. Like, there are some people out there who are not religious, who are not spiritual. And are very good people. Yeah. Good people who make good decisions, who help people, but in a church that may be frowned upon because they're not very religious. You don't believe in God. And so I, I think whatever helps your moral compass is beneficial. 
Yeah. Um, like I read the Bible. Um, I read the Quran that's been converted to English because it's not supposed to be um, in English. But you know, I, I read those things, and I, I think there is some guidance and some motivation in there. But I do struggle with the aspect of there just being one like power and there's only one way to get, get there. there. And, yeah. and it always bothered me that somebody would down somebody else's religion. They're like, well, you're yeah. telling them they're wrong, but you're right. And well, what kind of happens is too is you run into a lot of people who will play the fence with it as well. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I, I believe in half of it, but I don't really yeah. believe in the other half. But then it's another part that counters that part. So it's like... It's all or nothing. I mean, like, it's kind of like when people are talking about religion and, and politics or in life in general, they'll pick out the parts that they agree with and fit whatever they're trying to project yeah. on others, but then leave out this part about, thou shalt uh, judge my neighbor, or, you know, judge other people and stuff. And so, but, but you are. Yeah. And so I, I try to, like, avoid a lot of, a lot of that because it's, it, it can be interesting. <laughs> like I have had very few productive conversations about religion with people because they do get offended. Like really, I think it's, yeah. it's all relative to perception and experience Correct. as well Correct. when it comes to interpreting that and discussing it with somebody else. Yeah. We all have different perceptions and experiences in life. You know what I mean? I believe there's something out there. Without yeah. question. With with. Out question. There, there's something Hi, out yeah. there. There, there's a higher power. Somebody put us here, but we've also seen religion be used to Control. manipulate yeah. the situation. Like the church is one of the wealthiest things on the planet. Like Catholic Church. All of the money, money, churches, money, money. yeah. Joe Olstein was just talking oh, about oh, some man. of these people that got this super bread. It's like. You get this super money. Got that super mansion. And, and then, I'm, like, you got a lot of weird shit that be happening when if you in this kind of position shouldn't be happening. You know what I'm saying? And then people should just be following and listening to you still. Like, I was saying before, like, I, I think it depends on a person's character. Depending on if you really going to, how, how well you're going to intake the message. You know what I'm saying? Or right. if you're going to even listen to the message. You know, I found church most comforting in situations when I didn't have the answer for something. Yeah. And like we all get to that point regardless of where you are in your thought process that you don't have the answer for something. Yeah. And sometimes not having the answer to something is scarier than even having the answer sometimes. But like the unknown. I think mankind as a whole well, is terrified in, of unknown. We live in the unknown which <laughs> is crazy so we have to get more comfortable with it. Like we don't ever know if tomorrow gonna be here but we just go to sleep and assume that it's gonna happen. You know what I'm saying? You know, 80 years ago, unknown, not knowing something was okay. Nowadays if we don't know something it bothers the heck out of us because we feel like we're supposed to know everything. And I think that's why now you see a lot of people moving away from the church because yeah. sometimes it doesn't quite line up. It's not answering those questions. And there's other purposes for, like, religion. Um, it's a good it. blueprint if you don't have a direction, you know what I'm saying? Right. If you're just a kind of lost robot and you need to figure out how to get some connection. Right. And, I mean... No problem with church most of I go to church, um, not yeah. every Sunday, but I, I go to church and, you know, I listen, I take in and, you know, I try to better myself. I think there's a lot of ways yeah. out there to, to better yourself. Because you still meet a different kind of crowd of people at the churches than you would somewhere else, you know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. And, you know, I pray. Um, you know, we, I think that brings comfort to us, knowing that there's somebody out there that may be looking out for us. Like, Right now, I'm looking out for people at my school. Maybe that brings comfort to them. And, you know, as my brother, you may look out for me, but there are some things beyond our control, and we want to believe that there's a, a higher power out there to make us uh, yeah. comfortable, that we are seeing us. It's almost like me growing up, I always wanted to please my father. It was important for me to make my father happy and proud of me. It's like that time that your dad says, I'm proud of you. That's like one of the best days of your life. My dad said he's proud of me. Right? So if there's a higher being, you know, who's like a father or a mother or whatever, um, you kind of want to make them proud um, too. 
I was just sitting over here as we were talking, and I never really had this perception. What do you guys think about the theory that people come up with the concept of a higher power because they're scared to take the power for themselves? That's a lot of pressure to always be in control mm -hmm. and to always have to do it right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I never really thought about it like that. Because I feel like I manifest a lot of things in my life and mm -hmm. it gets like better and better and better. Right. But I'm not sure if it ever gets to a peak. But that's just something I was just sitting over here thinking about as we were sitting here building or whatnot. Yeah. It got me to a perception I never really thought about, you know? I think that's pretty interesting. Like, to, like... It's easy to pass on that responsibility to somebody yeah. else. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. then you can't fail. Like, we're... Without question, we, we are afraid of failure. Yes. And so yeah. if I pass it on to somebody else and they fail, that, that's on them. Yeah. Mm. So people go sometimes and then, like, pray, but they're not really focusing their energy. They're just really thinking about getting help this one time. They're not really yes. focusing their energy constantly from the time they wake up to the time they go to sleep. You know what I'm saying? So We always pray for things that we want to not necessarily need. Yeah. I want the winning lottery numbers. You know, I don't yeah. need them, but but I want them. And then we get upset when... God doesn't give us those those winning numbers, and maybe that's the lesson. You know, you don't need those winning numbers because you're where I need you to be right now. That's yeah. that's what I tell myself in life a lot of times. I'll be like, I want this, but you you must not need it right now. Because right. I mean, you've had it before, and right now you don't. So obviously, you need to be doing something else, or else you would never be doing this if you had what you want. You know, right, what I mean? right, right, right. Like, If I had everything I wanted, I probably would be motivated. And that's what made me start thinking about the question. Because once you start hitting yeah. some goals, you'll find yourself getting relaxed a little bit sometimes. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, oh, I done bust out three goals. Did. I'm about to, now two months done went by. You're like, wait a minute. Yeah, what, what didn't happen? I, but I think it, I mean, it makes perfect sense to kind of pass that, that yeah. on to, to somebody, somebody else. Because yeah. um, it's like the more you believe in yourself and you start focusing the energy, you'll see things happening. I see things happening a lot. That's what made me think about this. Yeah. I was just like, wait a minute. Then like the whole winter solstice, 2020 transparent vision, all this stuff happening in the world. And I just yeah. be looking at the world like, what the fuck y'all mean the pandemic? Like I bet we've been living like this as black yeah. people. Like like you said, like this is, I made more money now than I yeah. than I made. I'm just like I'm looking at the world and I'm like, 2020 been nice. Well, yeah. <laughs> but but here's, here's the thing, and you said the pandemic. I mean, there's a difference between viruses that may affect the white man more so than the the black man. Okay? Yeah. For for example, our community has been devastated by HIV for decades, right? And they've made some progress, but all of a sudden you got a virus that's taking out, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Not necessarily in the United States, but you know, across the world, yeah. and a lot of the people who are affected. Um, happen to be white, there are black people who are dying too, but... It wasn't no race to create no vaccine. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. You want to know what's interesting from the information I get, and I know I'm more in like urban networks and urban mm -hmm. areas, it seemed like black people got it more, so it's interesting that you said that. So, I would agree with that um, if you did like per, per capita, like... The, I mean, 50% of us is a whole lot smaller than 50% of another, another, another culture, right? Yes. Um, but one of the things in our culture is we're real big on connection, like communication, being with our family, and having gatherings. And so the most difficult thing for me during the pandemic is not being able to communicate with people. And that's and hard. trying to break connection. That, that's yeah. hard to me. So um, it's... It's difficult to explain. Like I survived the first two weeks, and after that, like I couldn't take it. And like you know, people were having little parties, little gatherings, and stuff. And yeah. you know, you go to them. And plus, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and plus, if you, if you honestly, if you honestly think about it, people of color stay together. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like we live in centralized areas, like you know, Atlanta, you know, or in Charlottesville. We don't spread out. Like you're not going to go to Montana and find like a lot of brothers out there chilling, unless, no. they're, in a, unless they're in a witness protection program or something. Yeah, like exactly. That. <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not going to Montana. There's not people that share our similar experiences or exactly. you know our culture or anything like that. And that's not against anybody who doesn't share the same experiences because 
any progress that we've made over the last 60 years could not have happened without the other side, people who are white, helping us fight. Like, it's, they're there. So I'm not trying to down that by any means. Yeah, no, because it's but what happened is it's the facts. And then when, when you speak facts, it's always like the compensation quote that you have to make. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, it should be okay to speak facts without trying to compensate. You know right. what I'm saying? Like, and I get what you're saying, yeah. but I hate the fact that we do these things. You oh, know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, it's no disrespect to any culture. You know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, I've, I've been I, both cultures. So, yeah. I mean, so, <laughs> but, but here's something I'll, I'll pass to you. So, uh, Phyllis Wheatley. Who? Phyllis Wheatley. She was okay. one of the, the first, like, the pre predominant uh, or popular black writer. She wrote, It was fate that brought me from my pagan land that taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God and a Savior too. So when white men came to, to Africa, they brought us Christianity. Yeah. And when we came here, most people of color in this country are still Christians. And some people will argue that that destroyed like our culture. And, and, and who we are because you've given us this religion that has not been present even though some of the oldest bibles have been found in africa yeah but by the time king james got his hands on it and his writers it completely changed yeah um and so a lot of people think they use religion to possibly mentally enslave us mm -hmm. because they're doing both yeah we are obviously um i don't think anybody would argue that by people love God, like they, you, we nobody's going to argue that. Yeah, we are we are spiritual beings. I think we know that, but just the way it's getting reworded to us kind of ties us up. You know what I'm saying a little bit. But um, on that note, you know what I'm saying we're going to wrap this thing up. You know what I'm saying it's been another dope episode. You know what I'm saying you want to let the people know where they can find you. Oh, uh, I'm I'm difficult to find. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Find me at school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find me at school. I'll be honest. I, I'm not really on social media that much besides yeah. Facebook. I am on. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, Mufasa83. Hey, gotcha. Gotcha. Make sure I drop that down below. You know what I'm saying. I appreciate you coming. Uh, thank you for having me, guys. Man, you appreciate know what I'm you all. Y'all yeah, make sure y'all check out the brands, man. We got the bully over here. You know what I'm saying. We got the trap wolf Godcast, You know what I'm saying. We just started something a little slight. You know what I'm saying, but. It's been another dope episode, you know what I'm saying? Yo. We got Chino Blizzy in the Yo, building, you like, know what I'm comment, saying? We subscribe. got Young Savage in the this building with us today. I'm your boy yeah. Track Beats, and we signing out. Peace.
Busy, teeny weeny, yellow polka dot bikini